that protein is not going to be any good to me anymore. Once I've denatured it, it's not going to come back together. Okay? So then I might want to do what you suggested, running what's called a native gel, where I put something in the middle and let things separate out accordingly, and then use a technique to try to figure out which one is my protein, cut it out, and purify it. Then it would still be folded. That would be useful for me. So sometimes we can't use SDS page. Okay? Make sense? Everybody can explain that to me on exam? I hope you can. Okay. All right. Now, this, if it were looking very clear, unfortunately, this is what, <laughs> it doesn't show up very well on the screen. It's actually a little bit better on the original. Uh, you'll see bands. And you'll see bands like you saw in that last one. And a band corresponds to a given protein of a given size. 43 kilodaltons will run at a specific place. Or maybe 21 kilodaltons or whatever. But they'll always run at about the same uh, relative position. Again, like we saw with DNA, the smallest guys work the fastest and move the farthest. Okay? And that just shows the chemical basis. You don't need to know that. Uh, there's the chemical basis there. You don't need to know that. Okay? And last, I want to tell you about something very cool here. Okay? Very, very cool. So we've seen that we can separate proteins now on the basis of size. That's very useful for me. All right? There's another technique called um, isoelectric focusing. I need to explain that to you. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine that with another technique and show you something I think you will, you will find very powerful. Before I do that, I've got to explain isoelectric focusing. Okay? So isoelectric focusing is employed in two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. I'm going to show you that in a second. But I want you to think about this technique first. Let's imagine I've got a tube. So I've got like my column, only now I'm going to lay it on its side. And in this tube, I take uh, some molecules, like let's say these detergents that I talked about. Okay? Well, they're not detergents. Instead of having to say one negative charge on the end, I've got some molecules in there that it may have two, or three, or five, or ten, or twenty negative charges on them. So I can have a whole mixture of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to say fifty negative charges uh, on that molecule. And then I take another set of molecules that have one positive, two positive, three positive, four, five, all the way up to say 50 of those. So in this tube, I've got a mixture of things that go from one negative or one positive all the way up to 50 positive or 50 negative as an example. So they differ in the amount of charge that they've got. Everybody picture that with me? I've got a mixture of it. I take this tube, and now I apply an electrical field to it. What's going to happen? Well. The negatives are going to line up over here next to the positive thing because they're attracted to it. The positives are going to line up next to the negative because they're attracted to it. And the ones that are the most negative are going to be at the farthest end. The ones that are the most positive are going to be at the other farthest end with a gradation in the middle, all the way down to the middle where it's zero. You picture this tube now? 50, 49, 48, 47, OK. All the way down to the point where we got zero. Now, what if when I pour that tube, I put my my proteins in there. What if I put my proteins in there? They're going to line up in exactly the same way across that tube, and I will have separated them okay, on the basis of their charges. Separate them in on the basis of their charges. They're going to go in the same place as their friends are in that tube that I put into there. Can you picture that? Minus 50 to plus 50, or whatever number I want to pick with zero in the middle. So now I've got a tube that's got my proteins going from the most negative on one end to the most positive on the other end. OK? You got that pictured? Now I take the tube and I cut it open. And I lay it on top of a polyacrylamide gel so that the left side of the gel has the most negative, the right side of the gel has the most positive, or whatever way I want to do it. And now. I put SDS in there, and I run it through the gel. So I add SDS, and now what's going to happen? So when I run it through the gel, in the second dimension, it's going to separate on the basis of size. So here's my tube. Okay? You can think of pH as having positive over here and negative over here. It's the same thing. All right? My proteins were separated first on this basis. Now they're running down this direction. They're separating on the basis of size. So if I look at my resulting gel, I see something very interesting. The ones that are on the left will be the most positive proteins. 
The ones that are on the right will be the most negative. The ones that are on the top will be the biggest, and the ones that are on the bottom will be the smallest. So if I were to look at a spot on here, I'd say, well, that guy is big and negative. This guy over here is big and positive. You with me? Now, the beauty of this technique, the beauty of this technique is I can take and I can bust open cells, and I can say, let's say I've got a, uh, a, a line of liver cells, okay? And I'm interested in the proteins that those liver cells are making, all right? So I grow up these liver cells, or I take a mouse that has liver cells, and I take its liver, and I grind up the cells, and I take all the proteins. I don't purify anything. I take all the proteins, I separate them first on the basis of charge, then I separate them on the basis of size, and on this one gel, I can separate every protein from every other one. Every spot on this gel corresponds to one protein. The denser the spot, the more of the protein. The lighter the spot, the less of the protein. Now I can do some experiments and say, oh, well that protein right there, that's DNA polymerase. This protein right here uh, is alcohol dehydrogenase, okay? So I can do some cool things and figure out which protein is which on there. That's really nice, but that's not the most powerful aspect of 2D gel electrophoresis. That's what I want to tell you now. Let's not run one gel, let's run two. One gel is just like I said. One gel, I take my liver cells, I grow them up, I separate all those proteins out there, and I say, whoa, there's my pattern of proteins. La-di-da, right? On the other gel, instead of starting with normal liver cells, I take cancerous liver cells. I take their proteins, I separate them on the basis of charge, then I separate them on the basis of size, and I ask the simple question, where do these two gels differ? Where do the cancer cells, do they make more of a particular protein than the other one does? Do they make a protein and the normal cells don't? Do the normal cells make a protein and the cancer cells don't? For all the proteins in the cell, I can ask that question and get a very simple answer. Now I can begin to see at the protein level what is causing or involved in that cancer. That's exciting, okay? In a couple of days, I can compare a normal set of cells to cancer cells. It doesn't have to be cancer. Let's say that I'm interested in a drug that I've just designed. Does this drug cause problems to the liver, for example? Or does it change something drastically in the liver? Or maybe I'm comparing an alcoholic liver to a non-alcoholic liver. In any case, all I have to do is take a normal liver and a comparison liver and do this experiment and say, where do the proteins differ from each other? It's a phenomenal technology. Okay? It's phenomenally powerful. It's, a it's part of a technology we call proteomics. And if you've heard of proteomics, this is one of the ways of doing proteomics. It allows you, whenever you hear omics, it allows you to analyze all, in this case, of the proteins of a gel simultaneously. All of the proteins uh, of a cell simultaneously. Does that make sense? Pretty cool, huh? It's really powerful. It's a very, very powerful technique. Okay. Everybody understand how we do those? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about just a couple brief things. I'm going to skip over HPLC. I don't think HPLC is really important for our purposes. Um, I'll just briefly tell you what it does. It separates on the basis of polarity. Yeah. Okay, so it's a good question. So two-dimensional gel electrophoresis contains two techniques. The first, isoelectric focusing. The second, SDS page. So that's the 2D, the two dimensions. The first dimension is isoelectric focusing, which is the ch separating on the basis of charge. The second technique is separating on the basis of size, and that's SDS page. Thanks for help, uh, reminding me to clarify that. Yes? No, you can't run them on the same gel, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately.
Okay, so the darkness of the band will correspond to how much protein there is. So if the band is darker, there's more protein. So I might say I've got more of this protein in the cancer cell compared to the normal cell. Maybe there's something interesting there. Make sense? Yeah, so the darkness actually does tell us something about quantity. The darkness of the, of the spot, that's right, yeah, 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 it is cool. Okay, so HPLC, very briefly, um, it's machine intensive, and the only thing I'm really concerned that you understand about it is that it separates on the basis of polarity. It's the first time we've talked about polarity. Polarity being something that is how uncharged it is, right? So if I take a fat, I talked earlier in class about a fat. A fat is uncharged. It doesn't form hydrogen bonds. It has very, very low polarity. If I look at glutamic acid, which charges very easily, it's very polar, it has high polarity. So with HPLC, I could separate glutamic acid from fat very easily. Okay? Very, very easy. I could separate on the basis of their polarity. It has nothing to do with size. It has only to do with how polar they are. If you're curious and you want to know the theory about it, come see me. I used to do a lot of HPLC. I'd be happy to tell you. But I don't want to, I don't want to give you the technical details here. Okay. Now. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is, are some techniques for working with proteins, okay? This figure I happen to not like in general, all right? Uh, well, actually, this one's okay. It's the next one I think that's bad. This figure illustrates that proteins are something that we can manipulate. So let's say that I've got that 2D gel that I just, I just ran, and I've got all these spots on there, and I've got a spot that I'm really interested in. Wow, there's a spot that shows up. It's in the cancer cell. It's not in the normal cell. I would sure like to know what that protein is that's at that spot. Be a good thing to know, right? Well, I can take that little piece and I can cut it out with a razor blade and I can extract that protein out of there. But it turns out that that protein, whenever you get an intact protein, it's generally too big to, to do much analysis on it. You have to break it into smaller pieces. So if we want to break a protein into smaller pieces, we have to use an enzyme called a protease to do that. A protease, P-R-O-T-E-A-S-E. -E. Proteases break down proteins. I'm going to show you how they do that. And proteases, of course, are part of our digestive system. Our digestive system, we eat protein, our bodies have to break that down so it can use the amino acids to do something. Our digestive system is full of proteases. Proteases tend to work in very specific ways. Okay? What proteases do is they break peptide bonds. A protease breaks peptide bonds. And usually, they break peptide bonds at very specific places. What does that mean? Well, here's a protease called trypsin. It's very commonly used in the laboratory. It's very common in your body, for example. So you've got a lot of trypsin in your body doing various things. Okay? Trypsin cuts a protein, that is, it breaks the peptide bond adjacent to where an arginine or a lysine residue is. It breaks it adjacent to an arginine or a lysine. So you can see that this protein, which has this sequence of amino acids, has been treated with trypsin, and you can see the places where it's breaking the bonds, and so now you get a series of pieces, each of which have been cut by that protease. Okay? In fact, this is a that the, this is a longer sequence of, of uh, a protein, but you can see here's an arginine cut, here's a lysine cut, here's a lysine cut, here's an arginine cut. Okay, and so we.